I didn't come to Mumbai to live amongst a bunch of foreigners. Yeah. You know, I came to Mumbai to live with Indians. This is Glenn, a globally award-winning theatre director from Australia. He moved to India nine years ago and now resides in Mumbai. We took a walk across his non-touristy neighbourhood and he shared with me why it's extremely safe for foreigners, how to inspire a beggar boy to love theatre and why Indians are the most successful immigrants in the US. I'm Max, an entrepreneur and YouTuber. Let's go! So this is my strip. So this area you've been living for how long? Uh, one year. There are not many foreigners, foreigner faces here. It's very local. No, I've, in my last year here, I've probably seen three, and I've always said to them, are you lost? <laughs> you know, <laughs> why are you here? It's not a tourist destination, yeah. but in a way, I, well, in one aspect, I wish it was, because this is real Mumbai. What's the chance I get my camera stolen like that, just walking the streets, like someone just grab it and run away? Street crime is very rare here. Mm. Very, very rare. I mean, I even had an occasion where, um, my first time ever in India, and we had a brand new camera, and we left it in the rickshaw mm. and went into the theatre. Um, and then we remembered. We came out and the rickshaw driver had been waiting for two hours for us. Oh my God. To give us back our camera, you know. Wow, um, that's so sweet. It's pretty much um, common knowledge that street crime is very rare here. I mean, if you're sitting in a really public cafe and you leave your camera right on the edge near the street, of course someone may take it, like anywhere in the world. But um, theft is seen as something incredibly bad here. Yeah. Um, thank goodness. It's not a place where people walk around saying good morning, good morning. But I, I maintain that it's one of my little. No, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna let go of that. I mean, I, I really enjoy communicating yeah. with people. So I tend to say good morning to everyone who I recognise. <laughs> In fact, this watchman now says good morning to me usually first. Oh, okay. Before I say good morning to him. Yeah, this guy. But it took me like a good three months to get him to say good morning back. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's understandable. It's a city of 27 million people. You can't say good morning to everyone. Good morning. Kezo. Good, good. Uh, Ek Packet Superstar Dana. My friend from Singapore. It's such a strong mix here of um, Hindu and Muslim and Catholics and everything else in between. And so no one is really that fussed who you are. Um, there's some areas that I've lived in where I've literally had people from other apartments knocking on my door and saying, who are you? <laughs> are you a Christian? I had one landlord, because I was a foreigner, accusing me of um, being a drug dealer oh. and wanted to look in my wardrobe. But here, I mean, there's just such a, you know, such a multicultural city, but this is one of the epicenter of multiculturalism. Yeah. You know, you've got everything in this little area, and that's what I love. It's, it's, um, it's eclectic. It's you eclectic, know. yeah. You can have, there's a chai waller that will do it, you know, with more cumin, and there's, a, there's another chai waller that will do it with more, you know, sugar, and that's because they're from different areas of the country, and they, mm. they make chai differently. So, you know, it's, it's very, very mixed here, which is one of the main things I love. Again, in, in some areas, I could be walking down the street, and total strangers will come up and say, selfie, selfie. <laughs> you know, because they want to take a photo with a foreigner. And I'm not a very good tourist, I don't like... Yeah. I, I, like I like the fact that I'm one person amongst 27 million people. And I can sort of disappear in that. And in places like Brasova, once people get used to the fact that there's a white person living in the area, I um, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just Glenn. He buys our goods, he eats at our restaurant, he buys my chai, and it's just like anybody else. I mean, of course, there's the fascination of learning about other cultures, and they ask me as many questions as I ask them. It's a very friendly area. It's fantastic. And I mean, I mean even here, where these two seats are, the other day, I was yeah. waiting for some takeaway, and um, the guy sitting there said, hi, how are you? And I went, hi. And we ended up talking for like 20 Sorry. minutes, mm. you know, about um, everything, you know. And he said, oh, I'm here all the time, come and say hello. And, and that's what I love, is that now I know, you know, that there's somebody, another person to communicate with. My name is Sanjeev Kapoor. Hi, Sanjeev. I'm Sava, how are you? Fine. So Diwali's coming up, so there's a yeah. lot more beggars on the street. Oh. A lot more. This young boy, 17 or 18, was trying to sell me postcards. And I'd been here a couple of years and I don't want postcards, I don't want any caps saying buy my postcard, buy my postcard, buy my yeah. postcard. No, 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 no. And then he said, buy my banana. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, buy my, <laughs> buy my banana. <laughs> and I said, do you have a condom on you? And he went, no. I said, right, sit down. And I rolled him a cigarette and said, you do not go up to middle-aged white men offering your banana and you don't have a condom on you. I said, no way, you've got to think of your health and blah, 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 blah. He's going, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. I said, have you ever been to the theatre? And he said, no, no, what, you know, Natak, drama. And um, he said, no, 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 no. 
I said, okay, I'm going to put two tickets at the door because I've got a show opening tomorrow yeah. night, I think it was, and you can come, do not be late, bring a friend and come and watch the theatre. And it was a 1960s <laughs> Polish play about totalitarianism, oh. absurdist. Okay. And I thought it'll be really interesting to see what this guy thinks. And he came and he arrived and I sat up the back and held his and his friend's hand because they were quite nervous of being there. And I let them take photos through it all, you know, blah, blah, blah. And afterwards I said, what did you think? And he said, it's changed my life. Wow. It was probably one of the best pieces of audience feedback I'd ever received in my life. Mm. That this young guy who was prepared to sell himself, yeah. let alone just postcards, was then sitting in a theatre watching a 1960s Polish play about totalitarianism and his comment being, it changed my life. Mm. And I kept in touch with him and I would meet up with him for coffee every year. And it's only been the last couple of years I've lost touch, but he's moved back to his um, home village. He now sells jeans and he's married with a baby and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And it's, um, I mean, not that my meeting with him changed his life completely, but I'm really happy that I witnessed that little journey of his. And I felt quite, um, as a foreigner, I felt quite good about saying to him, respect your health, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and don't just sell your banana. Because there are plenty of middle-aged white men who would come here with a lot of money who would abuse that, you know. So it's not about, it's not just about the locals' fault. Mm -hmm. It's about, well, this is what the West does as well. Yeah. You know, it uses and abuses this kind of situation. So be careful. I mean, Australians, were horrendous in Bali, you know, the way they just used Indonesia and Bali in particular as, as a place to get drunk, to get stoned and to have a lot of sex, you know, with, with people that they could buy, you know, and you're moving into a community that needs the money. Yeah. You know, so there's a love-hate relationship with the foreigner there of, you know, we love you because you have your money, we hate you because of what you're doing to our community or, or to my son or to my daughter or... Yeah. You know, whatever, and um, it's it's um, it's horrendous to see that, absolutely horrendous. So this is one of the sort of major fishing villages. Do you buy fish there? Yeah, we do. My partner has been making a documentary about uh, post three seven seven being turned over, like the the decr decriminalisation of gay sex, and they've been asking a lot of people from different various um, levels of society what they think about homosexuality. And what they found is that um, the people that are living in villages like this and who are selling the fish on the street had less problem than the more educated. Oh, why? And it was, uh, their thing was, well, if you're happy, you're happy. What right do they have to deny someone's happiness? Yeah. And most of the prejudice, you know, certainly against LGBTQ plus is, um, is British born or Western born. I mean, before the West came here, they're, they're, you know, it was just, well, it's fine, generally. Even, I mean, even historically, if you go like thousands of years back, yeah. India, I think India was like pretty open, like yeah, to sex absolutely. in general. Like, and they weren't calling it gay or straight. They yeah, were yeah. just calling it another. Yeah. You know, that there's there's another way to, to, to live. You know? yeah. So it was the West that brought all the prejudice in. I mean, 377 was a, a British sanctioned um, section in, in the law. It's quite interesting. In this village, there's a lot of um, young actors and artists because it's uh, quite affordable in here. I'm kind of curious, like, what's the percentage of like successful cases like people come to Mumbai for film industry and then they actually make it? Uh, it would Probably be not high. very, very, very low, like yeah. everywhere, you know, thousands. I mean, the difference being here is that you can get off a bus and say, I'm an actor because um, it's so unregulated. Whereas somewhere in Australia, I mean, it's very, very difficult to even get an agent if you're not trained. But yeah, the percentage of people who, whatever making it means, that make it is very, very low. I mean, my idea of making it is being a working artist, not necessarily a star, you know, and it's certainly something I, I try to tell my students, you know, aim to be a working artist, you've probably got more of a chance. If you're aiming to be a star, you have very, very limited opportunity to become famous. Mm. Fame is a byproduct. I've read that Indians, the, the most successful immigrants in the US, the, oh, most, wow. the most educated, huh. because like all the IT jobs, a yeah. lot of like these tech companies, they have yeah. like Google management, a lot of Indians and Google management. Oh, look, I mean, from my experience, Indian people are a sponge for knowledge. They're really good learners, very clever, very clever people. And I think it's partly because, I mean, the language thing of having so many languages and language is quite mathematical, you know, so it's, um, they grow up knowing. And I guess also like casting culture or like hardworking. 
Yeah. Do you, yeah. you want to make it to life? Yep. Yeah. Well, you don't work, you don't eat. Some people reacted quite a bit in the comments yes. when you mentioned about like uh, black market, how you said the economy will, would not survive without the black market. And some people say, oh, it's like a bit of exaggeration. It depends how people are living, I suppose. I mean, if you, if you were living in areas like this, then you access things like black market services quite a lot. Yeah. You know, if you're living in an area where you know you can call Nature's Basket, you know the most expensive supermarket, and just get everything delivered, then you're probably not mm. tapping into it. So, look, I mean, yes, the black market exists, and you know, eight out of ten Indians will say yes, it does. But I think what those people um, misunderstood that they they were thinking I was calling this the black market. Yeah. And yeah. this is not the black market. Yeah. You know, this is very legitimate. These people pay their taxes, like all of us do. You know. This is um, our fruit and veg. How fresh are them? Very fresh. Well, it depends on what day. Some days there's the crap, you know, and yeah. they've got a delivery coming. Uh, but um, it's generally pretty fresh. I mean, it's interesting because in, in Western supermarkets, you know, there's fruit and veggies so treated mm. that everything looks perfect. You know, here, you're going to buy a potato with a bit of a black spot, you know, or a yeah. carrot that's a bit weird looking. Gosh, Mumbai is one of the most well-fed places I've ever been in. There is food everywhere, food absolutely everywhere. There's a bakery around the corner if I want a chicken pie. But it always seems silly to spend too much money on eating out when you can eat in like street stalls, etc. for very, very inexpensive. And the food's fantastic. Have you ever had a food poisoning? Food the only food time I've had food poisoning was I had Subway. <laughs> I had a Subway sandwich and I got really sick. Okay. Apart from that, I've never been unwell from food. And yeah. I eat everything. You know, I mean, I eat everything from the street. What's that? Hello. Sugar cane. Sugar cane. Uh, dough, sugar cane, um, butter. It's funny though, there's some areas where you can't find a sugar cane wallet. Oh. And then there's other areas like this where there's two or three. Sugar cane is like high energy drink. It's natural sugars, it's, it's wonderful. And mm. for a thirst quencher, if you're really thirsty, have a sugar cane. Water-wise, it's safe, like ice and water? It's, um, yeah. yeah. My first three years I'd have no ice, but now, mm. Cheers. Cheers. It's very good. You, when you first come to India, to Mumbai, was it like shocking for you? Like so, so many people in the streets, like so many Look, cars it, and stuff. I certainly noticed it, but it never, I never felt scared or worried. I wouldn't say I was ever shocked. I think because I'm a little bit older, I was quite able to, you know, recognize, okay, this isn't Australia. This isn't my home. Yeah. This isn't anything I know, um, and to accept it. It was an adventure, that's for sure. I mean, even going out and buying eggs. Oh my God, where do I get eggs from? The learning process was huge, of just daily things that we take for granted. But that was, you know, part of the reason why I wanted to be here. I wanted to be, yeah. I wanted to be out of my comfort zone. I wanted to um, be reminded that it's quite a big world and Australia isn't the only way that people are living. So it's done its job. <laughs> That's for sure. Oh, you are so sweet. Thanks for watching the next video. Yeah, right here. This one. Thank you again and see you there.